uh, welcome to those who are here uh, to this uh, Brain and Behaviour Seminar uh, hosted in collaboration between the Psychology Centre for Health and Cognition and the Research Centre for Mental Health, Wellbeing and Creativity. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Nathan Filer. I'm a reader in creative writing and co-lead of the Mental Health, Wellbeing and Creativity Centre, along with uh, my colleague, Samantha Walton, uh, who is here currently uh, on a residency living on a pig farm in the Bavarian countryside. Um, is that right for some? It's exactly true. How are the, uh, how are the weekly ice swims going? Uh, really, really good. Yeah, pretty good. And the pigs are very cute as well, I can confirm. Uh, so today we'll be hearing uh, from uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Lucy Johnston. Uh, Dr. Johnston is a consultant clinical psychologist and author of Users and Abusers of uh, Psychiatry and co-editor of Formulation in Psychology and Psychotherapy making sense of people's problems uh and also um uh author i, I don't know lucy author or co-author of the straight talking guide co-author co-author that's a that's a, that's a fantastic book i'll put a link to uh I'll put, I'll put a link to that in the in the chat in a in a moment um the uh lucy johnston is co-author of a, a straight talking uh a straight talking guide to um uh, to psychiatric diagnosis um just gonna let some more people in. Um, so, so yeah, many many publications. Uh, also, Lucy is the former program director of the Bristol Clinical Psychology Doctorate, uh, and was the lead author of Good Practice Guidelines on the Use of Psychological Formulation. Uh, we'll be hearing, I'm sure, a lot more about formulation later for anyone not familiar with that that term. Uh, she's worked in adult mental health settings for many years, most recently in a service in South Wales. Uh, and she was lead author, uh, along with Professor Mary Boyle, uh, for the Power Threat Meaning Framework, um, a, a division of a uh, clinical psychology funded project to outline a conceptual alternative to psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, and this alternative to psychiatric diagnosis is uh, what Lucy will be focusing her talk on this morning. Um, I, I first met you, Lucy, didn't I, when I was researching uh, when I was researching my uh, second book, The Heartland, uh, Finding and Losing Schizophrenia. My background uh, is in mental health nursing, uh, which, which certainly at the, at the time uh, was very aligned with what we might broadly uh, call the, 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 the medical model. Uh, and I was interested when researching that book to, to gather a range of perspectives. Uh, I can't remember who, um, oh, thank you for putting that link up, Sam. Uh, I, I, I can't remember who, um, uh, who who now sent me in your direction, Lucy, but I was glad they did because uh, I, I, I met you, I interviewed you at length and I became aware of this, for, for me at the time, sort of entirely new uh, way of, 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 of thinking about, um, of thinking about m mental distress. Um, I, I, I should say that you are considered something of a radical uh in in some in some circles and that and that some of your views are uh are indeed quite controversial so we mightn't agree with all of them uh just gonna keep letting some people in um so we mightn't agree with uh we mightn't agree with all of them uh but that's absolutely fine isn't it and it'll be uh fascinating to hear them uh none, none, nonetheless so so thank you so much for joining us uh lucy I know you've got some technical support there to help you share your slides, but I'll uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll hand over to you. Oh, just one one more thing I'll say first. If um if anyone does have any questions as uh, as 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 Lucy presents her talk, let's save them to the end. But but please do type them into the into the chat box, uh, and then and then that'll be an easier way to to, to address to address them. Uh, uh, so uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, without further ado, I'll I'll hand over to uh, I'll hand over to Lucy. Thanks, Nathan. And you're right, the purpose of this brief talk is to stimulate thoughts and questions and not necessarily agreement. We will have an interesting discussion, I'm sure. And I'm just going to hand over to my homegrown technical assistant who's going to get my slides going because I'm really not good at that kind of thing. That one, yeah. 
while you do that, I should also say, I should have said, sorry, that Alexand uh, uh, Alexandra de Souza and Kate Muir uh, are, are also here uh, rep uh, representing the, uh, um, the Psychology Centre for, for Health and Cognition. Can you see those slides, Nathan, your end? Yeah. OK, and if I press a button, are they moving? Yeah. Great. OK, so I can't see any of you, so it's a little bit spooky just talking to my computer. But nevertheless, I'll do my best and then I'll stop sharing at the end and then we can have a bit of a chat, I hope. So I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the Power Threat Meaning Framework. It is a bit of a whiz through. You're welcome to have the slides. I think they're in the, the folder. So I'm not going to show you all the slides, but if you want to return and look at them, you will have them. And I'm, you do not need to read every word and every slide. Some of them are quite dense. I will highlight the most important bits of every slide. I'll, I'll share. I'll share that. Um, I'll share that folder now with everyone so they can. Excellent. Take Thank slides. you. So sample slides, a little bit of a flavour of a long, complex uh, project. And I hope to have 10 minutes at the end to take any questions. Um, so what is the Power Threat Meaning Framework about? It was published in 2018. The author group, as you can see at the top, we are all psychologists and uh, Jackie Dillon and Ella London are survivors, as they would call themselves, of the psychiatric system. People who had psychiatric careers and managed to escape psychiatry. So it's a document produced jointly by psychologists and service users. And it's very ambitious. It is attempting to move beyond psychiatric diagnosis. These ideas that are so deeply embedded in our culture that we tend not even to question them. The idea that people who are struggling emotionally in various ways are suffering from illnesses of some sort, mental illnesses, which is not a term I'd personally use, uh, that need to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder or personality disorder or anxiety disorder or depression or whatever. And this is based on the assumption that we can understand what goes wrong in our lives in the same way as we can understand what goes wrong in our bodies. And that in the same way, we need to look for patterns of things that may explain that, chemical imbalances and so on, for which there has actually never been any evidence or genetic flaws for which the evidence is absolutely minimal. And the framework says this is a failed model and we need a different kind of understanding of distress. The distress, of course, is very, very real. We're absolutely not denying that. But the, what we're questioning is the explanation. And it's not widely appreciated that, I mean, this is not just us, although Nathan described me as a radical, an increasing number of people are saying the same thing, including, interestingly, the very people who put together the diagnostic manuals. For those who are not familiar with it, DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's the complete list of all the ways in which you can apparently be mentally ill or disordered. It has various editions, and in 2013, the fifth edition came out. And the very people, the senior psychiatrists who put together these manuals are admitting there is no reason to believe it's safe or scientifically sound. Totally wrong, an absolute scientific nightmare. There's no definition of a mental disorder. I mean, you just can't define it. It's bullshit. Now, in my experience, no one is ever told at the same time as they're given a diagnosis that these categories, not the distressed people suffer, of course, but these categories have been described by the very people who drew them up as bullshit. And there is a great deal of effort being exp expanded, being put into actually developing new diagnostic manuals from the start. I think that's a project doomed to failure. But nevertheless, there are, you know, the, the whole paradigm is under, you know, criticism and may need to be fundamentally changed. And so here's a report from the United Nations saying that the, bet, the idea, the best solution for mental health challenges and medications and other biomedical interventions is a myth. We need to look much more at what's going on in people's lives. We should address the power imbalance, not the chemical imbalance, which is a very good motto to explain what the framework is about. It's about looking at the influence of power in people's lives, among other things. And very briefly, it's about replacing a diagnostic understanding with a narrative based one, a story, a personal story based on evidence, based on what we know about distress, about the reasons for your distress. And the framework is not. There are lots of links here, as you can see. This is the accessible version. If you're interested in finding out more, the link will be in the chat. 
it's not just about people who are said to be mentally ill. It is about all of us because all of us struggle at times. All of us experience distress at times. All of us live in a difficult world. So the framework says we are all storytellers and meaning makers. We are all capable of putting together understandings, which are non-medical ones very often, about the reasons for our distress. These understandings can be very healing, can show different ways forward. And across the world and historically back in time, that is how we have always understood distress. So the framework is about supporting people if they want to put together non-medical hopeful narratives about their lives and their struggles. And in order to do that, um, we have summarised the framework, which is a very, very long document, 200,000 words long, very long, a massive summary of all the evidence we have about biological, social and psychological factors in distress. And you don't need to read the long version. We think it's important that it's there because that shows that these ideas didn't just come out of our heads. They came out of a vast range of literature. But we have summarised that very long document in the form of some core key questions. So these are some of the key questions. You may be familiar with the slogan, instead of asking what's wrong with me, ask what's happened to me. That's quite a common slogan now, nowadays. The idea is we need to make a fundamental shift for away from looking at what's wrong in your, your head, perhaps your thinking, if you're uh, psychologically minded, perhaps your chemistry, if you're more biologically minded, towards what has happened to you. In other words, what's happening in your life. So these questions can be used as a way of framing a narrative and i'm going to talk about it at a one-to-one -one level today but the idea is these questions can also be asked at a family level at a social level at a community level and these are not meant to be questions you literally sit down and pose in those words in that order they are areas to consider and they're overlapping questions but nevertheless they can be used to help over a period of time, and you'd probably need to return to this if you were interested in doing this kind of exercise to construct a narrative that may throw some light on your distress and possible ways forward. So the book I just showed you describes in quite a lot of detail how you might do that if you're interested. So the questions are what happened to you in PTMF terms? How has power operated, operated in your life? How did it affect you? What kind of threats did it pose? What sense did you make of it? What's the meaning of these experiences to you? What did you have to do to survive? What kinds of threat responses are you using? And you might want to add or start with what are your strengths and pull it together in terms of what is your story, which might be a written story, might be a diagram, might be a painting, might be anything that makes sense to you. So I'm going to very briefly go through those four questions. I emphasise briefly, just to give you a flavour. So how is power operating your life? In the framework, we really wanted to put power first and foremost, because it seemed to us that the various forms of power that affect all of us are missing by definition from diagnostic understandings, but they're also missing for a lot of psychology and psychotherapy. As soon as we look for the origins of someone's difficulties inside them, if you like, then we tend to lose the emphasis on power. So power comes first and foremost in the framework and everything else follows from that. And we've very roughly suggested some ways in which power might operate. Now, you don't need to read all this tiny writing, but... There is, for example, legal power that can both operate positively and negatively in our lives. There is economic and material power. So many of the people who end up in mental health services have very little economic and material power, which understandably contributes to distress. There's interpersonal power. A lot of us, if we're professionals, are used to thinking about this, of course, the various ways relationships could go wrong and people can hurt or abuse or neglect or humiliate or exclude or shame each other. And the body of literature that supports that is called trauma-informed literature. Coercive power, these are overlapping forms of power. Of course, interpersonal relationships can be coercive. The power that's inherent in our bodies, for better or for worse, the attributes we have, the things we may lack. Social or cultural capital, or more 
subtle form of power, which means to do the education opportunities, the job opportunities we may have or lack, and that gives a sense of confidence and advantage in the world, or may operate against us if we're lacking those um, helpful aspects in our lives. And finally, ideological power, which plays a very large role in the framework. We've described it as control of language, meaning and perspective. This is not a obvious visible form of power. It's actually quite subtle. So this is about social norms, expectations, assumptions we all make about how we ought to think, feel and behave. Often, of course, that's transmitted through social media, through education, through messages everywhere, really, through advertising. So we are all given these messages constantly about, for example, what is it to be attractive or successful or a failure or a normal child or a happy family or a good mother. We are fed stereotypes about certain groups in societies. And very often ideological power works to promote certain vested interests, often people who are already more powerful and often at the expense of people who are less powerful. I don't want to get into a political discussion today particularly, but whichever way you voted, it's quite clear, I think, that Brexit was pushed by a lot of ideological messages, you know, terrifying messages about people who are going to flood our welfare systems. And clearly it's the end results operating to the advantage of people who are already more wealthy and privileged and to the disadvantage of many people who were already struggling in life. So we want to think about this in relation to people who are said to be mentally ill. What identity goes along with telling someone that they're mentally ill? It's not a positive one. It often actually acts to reduce their social capital, to inhibit their access to other forms of power. How much of the language and assumptions we're told about so-called mental illness is open to question? Now, in my view, all of it, not just my view, a lot of this is ideologically driven, not evidence-based. And why might that be? So a number of people who are part of the survivor movement have described how giving up their diagnosis, which was often a very re-traumatizing experience in their life to be diagnosed, was actually the start of uh, moving towards healing. So we would argue that the medical model of distress is actually an ideologically driven project. It acts to kind of label and sweep up and individualize the distress suffered by people, which actually the long term results in the end very often of unequal and unfair societies. Now, that's not to blame the people who work in the system who are doing their very best under very different circumstances, difficult circumstances. But it is to say perhaps we have fundamentally the wrong model for understanding people's distress. So we then move on to how did it affect you? I'm going to whiz through this because clearly if you consider power, you will then come up with a number of ways and aspects of your life, areas of your life in which you may be negatively affected. Now, of course, power can operate positively and protectively as well, but necessarily in the framework, when looking at the more negative aspects. But any of us who are trained as professionals are, have done so because we wanted to use, acquire the power to help people positively but it doesn't always work like that. So again, the negative operation of power can affect all these areas of our lives, including again, the things we're less used to thinking about, threatening our ability, for example, to make our own meanings out of our distress, telling us we have mental illnesses without offering people a choice about that. And there are alternatives, uh, not just the framework, there are a number of alternative ways of understanding. People are very rarely offered those. And typically, if people object and say, no, I haven't got schizophrenia or whatever, they will find that other forms of power are enacted on them, possibly forced medication and so on. So here's a couple of very brief examples of how the impact of power might affect people. Poverty, living in poverty, job loss. And we can see here that in the case of this man who's lost his job, it's not just the loss of a job that's affecting him, it is, you know, that those meanings are amplified by kind of gender messages, gender role messages, which is often how power gets enforced through expectations about what, in this case, men ought to be doing, what they ought to be able to do to support their families. So he's feeling an extra degree of responsibility and shame 
due to the messages that he's received from all around him. What sense did you make of it? So thinking about mean the meaning of experiences is very central to all, all forms of therapy. Again, we would argue that this is often done in too individualistic a way. We talk about our negative cognition. CBT talks a lot about thinking, well, thinking more positively in lots of ways. And that can be of some use, but the risk is that actually we then give a kind of subtle message in a way that if only you thought a bit differently, your life would be easier. And that may be very far from the case. So we also wanted to think about meanings, not just in terms of the sense you particularly have made of these difficult events, but in terms of, well, where do these meanings come from? Why do women who've been raped and abused almost always feel an intense sense of personal guilt and shame, for example? Why did the man in the previous quote feel so personally shamed and inadequate? So I've worked with many, many, many women who've been raped or abused. And one of the ways that I and my colleagues have worked with them is to think not just about how you do not need to feel so personally responsible for this, but about where do these messages come from in terms of why do societal messages about women being responsible for their own safety, let's say, and they should or shouldn't behave in certain ways, wear certain clothes when they go out and so on. And there's no doubt in, I think, in my mind that certain power interests are served by these meanings. So it becomes less important to look at the wider social factors that enable, you know, routine violence in women and girls' lives. And similar considerations apply to men, of course, as well. So what do you have to do to survive? So in PTM framework language, this is about threat responses. And this very roughly corresponds to what in mental health we might call symptoms, though it's not exactly the same. But in the framework terms, these are actually survival strategies. The panic you feel, the low mood, the, hear, the voices you may hear, all the rest of it, things that may be very genuinely problematic, actually started off almost certainly as ways of surviving. You had to react in this way in order to survive very difficult circumstances. And of course, your body and your, is involved in this as well as your mind. So the framework is not about ignoring the role of the body, but it's about seeing the role of your body as enabling and mediating your, your responses. It's not about your low serotonin causes your depression, a theory for which there has never been any evidence. It's about the impact of all sorts of difficult events on your mind and your body, and they interact in all sorts of complex ways. It's also worth saying that the framework does not assume that everybody has suffered some specific trauma, that it's very common in mental health services for people to have suffered trauma such as abuse and neglect and domestic violence, but it's not universal. And because of the impact on ideological power, the, the, the emphasis on ideological power, the framework also shows how simply living in, in a difficult world where there are very, very powerful expectations about achievement and success and how you look and how you behave and how you should live your lives that on its own can cause distress if you feel you're failing if you feel you're not living up to this, these expectations i think this is probably particularly tr true of young people who are of course bombarded with these messages via social media and who are facing an exceptionally difficult period in our history, I would suggest, in which all the things they are taught to expect and aspire to are actually more difficult than ever to achieve. So here are some examples of threat responses or in psychiatric terms, symptoms, but the framework also looks at more socially valued responses, such as working too hard or whatever, which are socially valued, socially encouraged. So we're not likely to see those as psychiatric symptoms necessarily, but nevertheless, they can for some people be unhealthy, of course, and can perhaps be understood as threat responses. Okay, so in psychiatry, if we, if we think about mental health services for a minute, we would be looking at these so-called symptoms for clues to what may have gone wrong. So classically, we'd be looking for, if someone hears very hostile voices, we'd be thinking about, well, what is the voice saying? Whose voice is it? Very commonly, the distressing voices people hear are, for example, related to 
the person who abused you or hurt you, the voice may say the same thing as, let's say, the bullies at school or whatever. We need to make a link between the threat responses and the threats, and that will help us to understand the best way forward. So restoring the link between threats and threat responses is a main purpose of the framework, which we kind of know and yet often don't really think about. We know at one level that people living in poverty are more likely to feel miserable and desperate, not surprisingly. But as soon as we know that, we tend to apply a diagnostic explanation. It's because they've got depression. And then we tend to go down the path of better drugs and all the rest of it. And then we tend to ignore the vital importance of making sure that people don't live in environments of poverty and exclusion. And that's in the longer term going to be a much better way forward to reduce the level of what we might call depression. That's not to say people don't need individual help, but individual help on its own is never going to solve the problem. It's mopping the floor while the tap's still running. OK, so here's an example of disconnecting the threat from the threat responses, which is recent and current. We're told there's going to be a tsunami of mental health problems post COVID. But actually, if we look at the people who are suffering most during and post COVID, it's people with more to feel it's people with more difficulties in their lives. It's people who are more financially uncertain. It's frontline workers who are exhausted. It's women working from home without support. So that is why I think it's unhelpful to start calling for an army of new mental health clinicians and many more services to deal with these consequences. Of course, services are understaffed that are underfunded, but actually what COVID has done has exposed the gross inequalities in our lives. We need to address those inequalities more directly. And I've suggested in this article, it's not a pandemic of mental health problems we need to fear, but a pandemic of mental health thinking. The idea we can understand all these responses as another pandemic hot on the heels of the first one and not address the underlying issues that are coming to the surface thanks to COVID. Here's another example of disconnecting threat from threat responses. It's rather a distressing one. This is the story of the true account of two um, young women who are identical twins, Sam and Chris, both of whom killed themselves. And the coroner found that borderline personality disorder was the cause of one of them, Sam's death. It caused her to kill herself. And the bigger picture is that both these young women had been seriously sexually abused from a young age and into their teenage years. So you can see how this really isn't helpful. We start instead, instead of thinking about, well, how can we identify and offer better support to, in this case, young women who've been sexually abused? And we instead talk about how the personality disorder has unfortunately developed and led to their deaths. Really not a helpful way of thinking about it. And finally, there's the widespread use of antidepressants, uh, the videos on TikTok and social media that are actively encouraging people to label themselves. This is a more recent trend. And while I understand that, that may give a sense of relief to some people, it is important to think about, you know, are these real diagnoses? Are these evidence-based categories? In our view, no, they're not. So although they may give you a sense of fitting in, at the same time, they are a way of labelling people as different in some way. And actually, there are many reasons why people might understandably feel, for example, overwhelmed and find it hard to concentrate and all the rest of it. I'm going to very briefly describe a couple of other aspects of the framework, one of which is that it what it actually suggests that instead of exporting our diagnostic model across the globe, which is what is currently happening, so that countries and cultures that didn't know that they needed the diagnostic model, which has failed in Western cultures, I suggest, are now being encouraged to take on a diagnostic model. And many of these countries and cultures already have ways of understanding, which often are, interestingly, narrative based and actually work very well and appropriately in those countries and cultures. So there's a couple of blogs there, just in case you're interested, of my fascinating experience of going to New Zealand and Australia, where I had the opportunity, particularly in New Zealand, to present the framework alongside uh, some people from a Maori culture, very different from our Western culture, 
which is in fact a narrative based one and so they understand distress in terms of their creation stories about the gods very different but actually at a very core level we were able to see that both the framework and Maori understandings are narrative based and actually deal with universal human themes of power, threat, meaning and threat response. So the idea is not to export the framework, but if we had something like the framework as our core understanding, it would put us in a much better position to respect, understand, learn from other culturally appropriate ways of understanding distress rather than seeking to impose ours. So the framework goes well beyond what we traditionally understand as causal factors in distress to look at histories of colonization, slavery, intergenerational trauma, and so on. And, in, and to include or to try and include forms of wisdom that I think we in the West have largely lost, which is about our relationship to the natural world, about integration of mind, body and spirit, and so on. So it's about the restorative part of truth telling narrative instead of diagnosis reclaiming our experience in order to take back authorship of our own stories i'm going to give you two extremely brief examples of how the framework's being put into practice because it's had a most extraordinary degree of success since it was published in 2018 which we never expected uh it's been uh, translated into six other languages i've been to all sorts of countries to talk about it and it's being used, at least to some extent, in a number of settings, both inside and outside services. So in uh, a very large trust in northwest London, for example, there is a project based partly, not entirely, on the framework, which has been rolled out across their inpatient wards, which is a, you know, a very medicalised environment, difficult to introduce change. And as a result, they now have not the least satisfied, but the most satisfied staff in their adult wards. They've seen dramatic uh, reduction in levels of seclusion and restraint. The staff are feeling much more confident and happy in what they have to offer to people. And the people, the patients on the wards are also reporting that they feel much more happy with the service they've been given. And finally, I'm going to very briefly show you um, an example of somebody who um, runs a peer group that is a group for people who've been through the psychiatric system and have set up their own support outside the services to think together about how they might uh, offer each other support and help and understanding and this particular peer group came across the framework and they decided to collectively work through these core questions as a group and help each other to think about does this make better sense of my life and my story so the woman who runs this peer group amanda griffiths has kindly given me permission to give you an example which is her story and i hope this might help to bring the framework to life a bit so this is amanda's own account of the power abuses that she experienced which i will leave you to read She's had a long and very difficult time in services, uh, which arose out of a long and very difficult time in her early life. And as a result, she was given a diagnosis of personality disorder. I'm probably going to whiz through these slides fairly quickly so that you do have a chance to read them um, if you want in full. But for the sake of leaving some time for discussion, I will move on. So many influences of power in her life. And as a result, she experienced many threats, flashbacks, uh, disturbing dreams, feeling angry, anxious, exhausted, unwell. Not surprising given everything she'd been through. So this is how the power abuses played out in terms of the threats in her life. Okay, and with my eye on the time, I'm going to move forward to the next slide. This is her thoughts about the meanings that she attributed to her experiences. She sadly, but 
actually quite typically, I would suggest, started to believe that it was her fault. She was worthless. She was defective. And of course, a label of borderline personality disorder does tend to reinforce that message. The world seemed unsafe. Relationships seemed unsafe. She even thought that she'd be, be better off dead. And how did you cope with all this? In psychiatric terms, what symptoms did she have? In framework terms, what threat responses did she use? Well, she did all sorts of things. She felt she had to be very subservient to people. She was constantly alert, watching out for signs of danger. She was very cautious and distrustful in relationships. Sometimes she'd get very angry because she was convinced she was going to be hurt again. Sometimes she dissociated, she cut off from her feelings. And sometimes she tried to control her, her, her food and sometimes her eatings, and sometimes she used alcohol. So I think we can see that the threat responses are clearly linked to the threats. They're not best understood as symptoms of an illness. They are understandable ways that she had to use to deal with the threats that she'd faced and was still facing in her life. However, she also is able to acknowledge she has a number of strengths, as you can probably tell from her account. She's read a lot about psychology and trauma and distress. She's a highly intelligent woman. She has good relationship with her peers. She's met some very helpful professionals as well as some who have been unhelpful to her. And she has a lovely family who give her strength and determination to get through the day. So pulling all this together, this is her story. This is how she puts it together. I'll leave you to read that. It's a story that doesn't deny any of the difficulties she's been through. Certainly doesn't say everything's now fine. But it does show that these responses are understandable and it highlights her strengths and it shows how she's finding ways forward. And it's a very different story from you have a borderline personality disorder. It's a story acknowledging difficulty, but it is ultimately a story acknowledging strength and hope. And I'm very pleased to say that Amanda has joined us on the Power Threat Meaning Framework Committee, which is a group of people who, um, psychologists and people who've been to the psychiatric system, who are collectively supporting the framework as it develops, offering some advice to people, putting people in touch with each other and offering training. And Amanda has um, joined us to offer training in the framework, which she does very well. So again, we want this framework to develop not as an expert professional driven project, but as also working very closely with people who have been on the receiving end of psychiatric services. Finally, here is a report from another peer group. Uh, Hannah Komatsu is a peer worker in New Zealand who has introduced the framework to her group. And she's talked about the impact of introducing the idea of power, which is very new to some people. But for many people, and many people have told us this, it's quite a revelation. I've never thought of it like that way. And now that I think of it that way, I can never see it quite the same. And it may be people, people may be initially quite angry about it. Or, But for some people, this is an optional framework. Of course, no one has to read it, agree with it, find it helpful or use it in any way whatsoever. But for at least some people, it helps them to find a new perspective and a new way forward. OK, I'm going to call for my technical advisor to stop sharing, or perhaps I can just stop share by clicking on that, can I? And then we can have, we've got about a quarter and a half a bit of chat and discussion. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Lucy. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think you've, you've you've stopped sharing the screen now. Uh, th thank you so much for uh, for that uh, really interesting talk. I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, questions. Um, I, we're record we're recording this session. I think um, so people can sort of speak freely and we don't get involved in all issues around confidentiality. I will now. Um, I will now stop the. Uh, I will now stop the recording. Um, so uh, so we can uh, then have then have questions but again thank you very much for that